All right, what's going on, everybody? Thank you for jumping in. Um, I'm actually really frustrated because I had a really awesome camera set up here with an awesome microphone and my, you know, mirrorless camera, but it stopped working like minutes before we were going to go live. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'm really frustrated, actually. But we got the, you know, good old FaceTime camera on a, on my MacBook and the mic for my headphones. So hopefully we can get this rolling. But um, real quick, I just wanted to mention a few things. Uh, if you're new to this channel, thank you for uh, jumping in and being here. I uh, appreciate having you. I'm Parker and uh, I run a business called Stock and Barrel making uh, leather goods um, and also sharing a little bit of, you know, fun content on YouTube and sharing a little bit about how the business works and everything. So, um, uh, yeah, thank you for being here. I appreciate you jumping in. I uh, wanted to mention a few other things. Let's see. We got some fun videos coming down the line. Um, we've got one. Uh, oh, yeah. So about six months ago, I did a video called Five Leather Workers to Watch Out For. Had an awesome response, and I wanted to do it again. Might be doing it around every six months. So we got one of those coming down the line with some new leather workers that have inspired me and doing some really cool, unique things. Um, also, I'm going to be making some motorcycle accessories for my uh, other business called Busket Arrow. That's going to be a fun one. Some like canvas and leather tool rolls and little uh, bar bags and stuff like that. Um, and then we got a few like technique videos. It'll be kind of shorter, just some nice, uh, valuable content that should uh, help out anyone who's getting started in the craft. Um, I just, I also wanted to read off just a few of the people who recently enrolled in the Start Selling Your Leather Work online course. Uh, we had quite a few come in just yesterday, but I uh, wanted to thank Aaron Crawl, who actually, he's a friend of mine. I didn't know he enrolled. Uh, thanks, Aaron Crawl, Robert Arnold, Morgan James. Roel Chapa, Randy Hughes, Timothy Freeze, Clinton Skulls, Travis Stout, Jason Barnes. Uh, thank you guys for jumping in. Uh, make sure you get into the Facebook group because that's where the conversation keeps going. But the online course is really valuable for anyone who's trying to get started in, um, not, not trying to get started in the craft, but trying to get started with selling your work and how to market yourself, how to set up a business around it. So a lot of valuable content in there and there's really no risk to it because we have a 14 day money back guarantee. So if you do the course, it only takes a few hours to get through the whole thing. And if you if you don't feel like there was any valuable, any value in there, then I'll issue you your, you know, full refund, no questions asked, but I'm confident that it's going to be really helpful for you uh, getting started and selling your work and either having a little side income or, um, you know, possibly, quitting the nine to five and doing this full time. Um, it's a lot of work, but it's really rewarding and it's fun. It's a good community to be a part of. Speaking of the community, um, we got an awesome guest today who needs no introduction. Uh, he's been a, just a stalwart in the Leathercraft community, just someone who's always bringing tons of valuable, valuable information and content. And uh, I've learned a lot from him myself. So I'm excited to have him here. Odin Leather Goods. <laughs> Odin Clack from Odin Leather Goods. What's going on, man? Hey, Parker. How's it going, man? Thanks for having me today. Doing good, dude. Thank you for jumping in. I know you're a busy, busy guy. Um, I, I, honestly, I don't know anyone else who looks busier than you. The the way you you accomplish the big batches of uh, products that you put out, and then the, and then somehow you still manage to put up a lot of content on Instagram and YouTube. How do you do it all? <laughs> Well, first, that's a that's a good compliment because I'm always I always feel like I'm behind. I always feel like I'm not posting enough, especially on some of the new platforms like uh, YouTube and, and and even Instagram. Yeah, I don't. I feel like I'm not posting as much as I used to, and that's something I'm trying to I'm trying to fix. Well, it's it's a hard balance because I know you're you're starting to put more up on YouTube, which yeah. has a lot of value both for the community and for you. But it's a really hard balance because you always have to play that game of like, well, what do I put on Instagram and what do I put on YouTube? And you, you really can't do both because they're such different formats. But but how do you balance that? Uh, how do I balance it? I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> For me, you know, I, at the end of the day, we're a production shop here. So we are producing as, as much as possible. And content creation tends to get pushed off, right? I mean, that's it. I mean, every, we all know creating good content is an important part of growing the business these days. I mean, 
how else are you going to share your brand with you know all these people? But uh, I'm always bouncing. Okay, do I go make a video? But if I make a video while I'm making this thing, it's going to take five hours longer than it should, and I've got to get yeah. 50 these out today. It's a really tough thing, and I I'm the first to tell you I I have not figured out the balance yet. Um, I'm just too stubborn to give up. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of how it plays out. To be honest with you, yeah. I get out what I can, and then I, I try not to stress about it. Yeah, I feel you on that. Yeah, I, I couldn't say that any better. It's so hard. I mean, I don't know if it's just a curse of being an entrepreneur in general, but you just never feel like you're doing enough. There's always something you're coming up short on. I, I've I've relaxed a lot. I've tried through my best to to relax a lot and take some deep breaths as I go through this journey. You know, I mean, there was a point in time where I could I couldn't even hardly leave the workshop at night because I'm like, oh, I haven't done enough to earn going home yet. I haven't done enough to to earn going home and going to sleep yeah. before 11 p.m. Right. Um, I'm not so bad anymore. I, I'm kind of settling into, you know what, you do the best you can every day and then you, you move on to the next day. It's, um, you know, I think for people that follow us and I get lots of comments, you probably do also on Instagram, people asking questions and, you know, giving us not so really wonderful compliments. I try to tell them, you know, <clears throat> you know, we only show a very small portion of our ourselves and our brands. Yeah in our, our life, you know, on these platforms, because that's what they're there for, right? What they don't see is, you know, things don't always go as planned, things don't go always go right. Uh, and they have to give themselves a little bit of credit, they have to give themselves a little bit of room and some grace uh, that, you know, yeah, so what you only made four and the next guy on Instagram made 50 of them or whatever it is. Uh, you know, you really can't fall in the trap of comparing yourselves with, with those folks, especially don't compare yourself with me, because I'll be the first to tell you, I'd make <laughs> tons of mistakes throughout the yeah. day and throughout the week. So uh, oh, too, everyone man. needs to be a little, take, give themselves a little grace is all I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, that's probably one of the, oh man, that's gotta be one of the hardest things in the, in just in this whole world. And it, like my whole experience in 10 years of doing this is the comparison factor. Yeah. It really is the, I can't remember who quoted it, Teddy Roosevelt or something. It's the thief of joy. And it just describes it so well because you can just be plugging away, loving what you're doing. And you see one Instagram post and you go, well, how did he, score that deal or how did he yeah. afford that workshop or how did you know it's a it's just the never-ending like you know thief of joy so yeah you you have to find a way to overcome that and it's so hard man it's really difficult i mean you want to be a part of the community and i i do i mean i watch everyone's stuff and i'm so happy when people are achieving and, and yeah. doing these great things you know and and new workshops or what a new product designs or whatever, you know, and I'm always thinking to myself, man, that's awesome. I wish I had done something like that. Right. Um, but you've got to make sure you're not falling in the trap of, oh, crap. Now I've got to go back to the workshop and I've got to try to do the same thing. That's not the business we're in. We're in the business of being creators and making things and selling things. And, you know, our customers will be there. The, the marketplace will be there when we get there. We don't have to rush ourselves to to. In, 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 in a comparison to what somebody else is doing. It's just every time I feel like I've, I'm I'm chasing after something someone else is doing, I end up making a bad decision for me and my business, right? That's a really good point. Yeah, I've done the same thing. Yeah, you see something someone else is doing, you're like, maybe I should be doing that. And you start sure. chasing and you go, that was the wrong move. I got to follow my heart, follow like what I truly want. And yeah, Figure out how to man. admire, support, you know, appreciate what everyone else is doing. But resist the chase, resist trying to play someone else's game. You play your game, you grow your business at the pace in which your business is supposed to grow, right? Don't overextend yourself. Yeah, you know, yeah. And you'll be just fine. You know, Leathercraft has been here thousands of years, right? It will be yep. thousands more years. There's time for you to, you know, you don't have to go buy that big machine today just because so-and-so else, uh, another guy got it, right? Take your time, get it when you, when, get it when you need it, get it when you can afford it, get it when your business is ready for it, not, because so and so got it today. Yeah, it's so funny. That's a question. I'm sure you get this question a lot too. But I'll have people be like, "When's the right time to buy a sewing machine?" And it's like there's really not this canned response that everyone. Well, once you're six months into it, you know, it, it totally depends on your business model, and maybe you're not even a business guy. Maybe it's just a hobby for you, and you get a lot of therapy out of the hand stitching, and you know, the the more like slow, meticulous prop parts of the process. And so then my answer would be like, "Don't get one." So. Yeah. There's a uh, yeah. There's really not like a canned response that works for everybody. I had a um, I had a conversation with a, a young guy. Um, it was maybe la early last week, and uh, he was basically you know going through the process of figuring out how to get his business off, off the ground. Which is, in fact, I, I recommended your course to him 
Uh, so oh, I think cool. that's a great place to start, um, you know, as a resource. But he was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to I figured out I got to say 40 grand to go full time this business. I was like, 40 grand. What the heck are you buying? 40 grand. <laughs> I was like, my God, that's a lot of money, buddy. You don't need to say 40 grand yeah. and gonna quit your job and automatically spend 40 grand overnight to, out, to me. And we're all different. But to me, that is a lot of weight to put on his shoulders to say, I've got to say 40 grand to start a business. Start with what you got. You know, that's where that, that I, I, to me, that's where the best way to do it. start with what you got and then buy more machines as they're needed. You know, and even still 40 grand is a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, th well, and that's I've kind of always touted Leathercraft is uh, that's one of the things that I love about it as a hobby, but also as maybe something that you're going to bootstrap as a business because of the low barrier of entry. You can literally buy a couple hand tools and make some beautiful products. Yeah. And and get into it slowly, bootstrap it. You don't have to go invest in a full workshop with every machinery and you know tens of thousands of dollars worth of leather before you. A lot of businesses, that's the case. Like if you want to start a restaurant, you got to hire staff, you got to have the building, you got to have the you got to have everything dialed in before you open those doors. And uh, I really love that about this. I mean, that, that's why I exist today. I'm sure it's the same case for you, but it started out with me just tinkering in my garage or my living room to end up, you know, going, oh, maybe I can kind of scale this slowly and buying more tools. And um, there's yeah. not very many hobbies or crafts that you can really do that with. I mean, even woodworking, you've got to have some pretty serious equipment to to be successful at it. And leather works not that way. So I think you got to I mean, lean into it. A guy once who was he was using a fork for a like a, a stitching chisel, you know, <laughs> puts his holes in the, a fork. Yeah. What can you believe that? No, I, I'd probably suggest you go out and buy at least, you know, uh, uh, thanks, Josiah. Uh, I'd suggest you go buy yourself, you know, five or six dollar, you know, cheap you know, stitching chisels. But, yeah, hey, it doesn't take much, you know. Seriously. Yeah. And um, yeah, you can get creative with anything. You know, in, in your um, business, you know, you know, I'm always surprised too at like what different craftsmen are able to come up with. I mean, most of the the old oh, sorry, I think that maybe there was a lag. I, it, I I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, 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 it's quite all right. I think there is a little bit of lag. We'll work through it. No, no worries. Um, I mean, I I look at most of the the older saddle makers. I've 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 had a, you know pleasure to go visit, and the really good ones, the ones that we always look up to, and we say these are like master leather craftsmen. They have very few tools in their workshops, right? They're getting by yeah, with just a yeah. bare minimum. And those other ones of us that are still trying to figure things out, we're buying tools left and right and trying out what we can. Those guys are figured out what they need and they've gotten rid of all the superfluous stuff, right? That's where I strive to be. So I will tell anyone that's looking to get started, don't go buy thousands of dollars worth of tools because I'm going to tell you the first thing you're going to learn if you buy that many tools is that you don't need most of them or, or you don't like using them. You know, just go slowly. Buy what you need when you need it. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree, man. By the way, I want to do a little test here. Are we still lagging a little bit, or are you hearing this as I'm saying it? I feel like I'm hearing hearing it as you say it, but maybe yeah. not. I, there's actually a little delay. There was a little delay there. So, um, yeah, we'll have to work through this. I'll try not to talk over you, and we'll just ask some questions and try and keep a little bit of gap there. But I'm not sure why that'd be happening. My Wi-Fi is pretty strong here. Yeah, the reason why I'm in my office today is because I was worried about my Wi-Fi. So I'm actually on a wired line here, which is good. It's just so we don't have too many issues. Which means it's probably mine then. I, I, I'm like working off of a booster, which so I can't <laughs> hardwire into it. So I need to figure that out for future live streams. I apologize for this. No, no. You know, I was usually I would be in the workshop some of this so you can see the background. This isn't a very, you know, fun background, but um, at least it's a strong connection. Oh, yeah. Works great, man. So tell me what you're focusing on mostly right now. We always go through like different waves of what we're, you know, setting our sights on. What are you guys working on right now? Oh, man. So uh, leather wise, you know, we're working on trying to point our, our sights towards fall at this point. Um, if you're in business, you have to start thinking about what your fall lineup is going to be yet. You know, you're probably already behind. So we're starting to figure out, OK, and plan out what are we going to be making for the fall? Are there any new products we're going to roll out? And there are a few uh, small products that we're trying to roll out. Most people probably know I have my online store, which is doing really well, but I also have the retail store. Right. So 
managing the retail store is a different ball game because we're trying to figure out when the the peaks and you know and and, and ebbs of of, uh, of of customer traffic are and make sure we have enough product in the store for that so that's really what we're focused on we've got some content issues not content issues but some content projects going right now um we i didn't know they were going to do this but i think it was yesterday the day before magnolia network um the chip and joint gangs thing uh, that was announced. So we have an episode on 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 their network that's going to air. What? Yeah, pretty soon. Woo! That's amazing. Dude, I was gonna, that was one of my questions I had for you because I saw that post and I just wasn't sure what it is. So yeah. they have a they have a network where they're highlighting different makers um, yeah. in each episode, or how does how does the series? So work? they have the Magnolia Network, which is you know a collection of all the shows that are kind of fall under their brand. But I'm on a show called Self Employed. Okay. And I spent, the, and I, I'm assuming I can talk about this right now because they're talking about it, but I'm on an episode of Self-Employed where I talk to another entrepreneur. We basically talk about the day in life of what goes on here at Oden Leather Goods, how I got into the business, what we're, you know, my philosophy on things, if you want to call it that. Uh, it was a really good episode. Uh, I think I haven't even seen the, the edit of it yet, but I tell you, I enjoyed the time I spent with the, with them. Um, I'm hopeful that it's going to come out really, really great. And uh, of course, we're also hoping that it's gonna, you know, toss a little business our way. Um, you know, that, that would be great too. <laughs> I can't imagine how you know that it wouldn't. I mean, that that's incredible. And and do Chip and Joe get involved with this at all? Like, did you get to meet them, or were they totally separate from it? Yeah, they're totally separate from it. Uh, I did not get a chance to meet them. It's just their network. Uh, the host of this show is a different gentleman who actually happens to be from the Dallas Fort Worth area. Um, but I hadn't met him before. I had heard about him, heard great things of him and his business that he had built on his own. In fact, he's even opening his own hotel now, which is really, really impressive. Uh, so it was cool to meet him and chat with him for a couple of days. Yeah. But no, haven't met the uh, the Chip and Joanna Gaines just yet, <laughs> but it's on the list. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they're a little busy. <laughs> Probably, just a tad bit. <laughs> Yeah, dude, that's incredible. I mean, that th those kind of opportunities are, like are what really open the door. You know, like we we had like on a much smaller scale, we had a a PBS show. It was called Startup or something like that. Come and do like two days of filming, and we had a whole episode. And you know, they they kind of promised a massive exposure. I mean, I'm sure they had it. It was like three hundred thousand views the first episode or whatever. And I was like, yeah, this is great. And we didn't see like like my business partner was like, we got to prepare our site for the massive surge of traffic coming in. I'm like, I don't know if it'll be that way. I hope it is. And it really wasn't. But what we did notice is we saw like huge windows of opportunity open up coming in through the inbox. People are like, I just saw you on the show and we want to, you know, we want to feature on this blog or this whatever. And it just yeah. kind of like opened up the door to so much exposure and cool opportunities. So if, if at the very least that's going to happen. That's been kind of my experience as well is that um, people would think that, these things air and all of a sudden tons of business come through and next week I'll be driving yeah. Bentley or something. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in fact, what it really is, it's more like a momentum game. It gives you a surge momentum and all those emails come, discussions come and the business, the business I get out of this probably won't come from that episode. What it will come from is the discussions and conversations I will have over the next year that were maybe uh, fueled by this episode. So it takes a little time, but it's all business. I mean, it's, it's a long-term game. Not It's not about what happens immediately. It's what happens over, over a longer period of time. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's going to be beneficial, man. I, that's such a cool opportunity. And the photography they got was really cool too. Just who, so, so was that the host that you were sitting on the couch with in that? It post? Was, yeah, Jonathan. Okay. Yeah. 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 He seemed like a cool guy. I'd love the shot. You've got the perfect <laughs> shot for it. Uh, I love it, man. You know, when I look at that picture, the one thing I, I, I think about is uh, I, I'm i a big guy in a little chair, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think that every time I see a picture of me. Oh, man. Yeah. I'm a big guy in a little chair. I was like, man, that was not – that's in my workshop. And um, I typically don't sit in those chairs uh, because it's just not very comfortable. And he's a smaller guy. He's sitting there. He's relaxed and cool. And I'm like, well, I'm kind of – Wedged in here right now. <laughs> yeah, trying to like tuck in the tuck yeah. in the gut a little bit. That's that's how every picture I've ever taken, man. <laughs> I, but there is something to be said about if you're a big guy with a beard, I think you just you have a little bit of an edge in the leathercraft game. There's something to it. 
Well, apparently I, I can never shave my beard off now because it's become <laughs> it's become part of my brand. <laughs> so yep, um, yep, me too. It's here to stay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we when we were for everyone that's here um and didn't see the post when we did a DLS meetup in in Georgia, we had a uh, Bill and Shane who Shane by the way is like almost 7 feet tall or something, right. maybe not. Maybe that's just how I perceive him. He's tall though. Yeah, and then, you know, you got Odin and Bill and I just a bunch of big guys and we were all standing together and we decided we had to start a boy like, band. A, a boy band. Yeah, a big <laughs> beard town or something like that. So that's coming down the line. That'll happen. That was a good, that was a good, um, that was a really good meetup, man. I, I really enjoyed doing it. Hopefully we can do something like that again. And, you know, I, I'm hoping that at some point in time I have a, a place here because we're going to, we're going to hopefully be moving workshops in the next, you know, oh, month, cool. month and a half, which I'm really excited about, but I'm hoping to have a space where I can invite more makers in and uh, we can do things like that uh, in, in the future because it's, it's, I mean, that's what really just drives me in, is the conversations and talking and the community um, I mean, the leather craft is cool. I, I totally enjoy that, man. But I really enjoy the relationships I've been able to build more than anything. Dude, I can't relate to that enough. I, I, I yeah, I, I've always had a hard time putting a finger on that. But like, I personally don't get a lot of um, like joy and fulfillment out of like the nitty gritty details of the craft, like which yeah. stitching punch to buy and what weight of leather to use. Like, those are usually the questions that come in. And I don't as much love that side of it. It's more of the connections that that we make, and the community is just so vibrant and fun to be a part of. And and the simple idea of just creating things is really fun for me. So that is addicting, and and that's why we're here doing this right now. Because I think I would say that's probably the one thing missing from the leathercraft community, and maybe just in general in the world, is that we can't get together more and do more of those like DLS type meetups where we're right. you know having little, uh, you know, I, I guess just big meetups. It, it doesn't even have to be a panel or anything like that. Just being able to get together and talk shop and, and have a beer is just like one of the coolest things. You know, I mean, for me, I'm going to talk about myself being, it can be really lonely at times being in the workshop. I mean, yes, my kids are right there. My wife's right there, but your head's out in the workshop day and night and you're, you're processing things in your mind. And, and just having other people to, to talk to and share with and say, Hey, did you experience this? Or, Hey, the leather did, I mean, again, it's not so much about the craft as it is about, Hey, can we bounce ideas off each other? Can we learn from each other? Can I feel like I'm not by myself? You're right. That is really, really important. Instagram, yeah. who would have thought, you know, I know Instagram is struggling right now, but Inst I think Instagram was very much so um, helpful in building that community. It's where I got started. Yeah. Uh, and so now I'm just trying to find ways to, to keep it going. And so my dream road leather is one of the many dreams, obviously, is that I have the space where I can invite anyone to come in and say, hey, Thursday nights, you know, Saturday mornings, come on by, you know, here's some tools you can use, you can learn, we can share, you know, Leathercraft is not Odin Leather Goods. Leathercraft is, is, is bigger than me. And I just want to be kind of a steward of some of those things in my area. Yeah. Uh, and then I love the idea of being able to do calls like this and, and yeah, you know, I told you before, I want to come up and visit you, you know. Oh, yeah, we'd love it. I'd In love other it, industries, you know, this would be like, oh, no, we can't do that. Why would I ever share my workshop? With someone? Who cares, man? I mean, yeah, my customers, yeah. Aren't your customers, your customers aren't mine. There's enough for all of us. You know, let's help support each other. Yeah, absolutely, man. I love that. Yeah, I think that's like that's probably one of my biggest arguments for wanting a bigger space, bigger shop, <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. I mean, for one, we need to we need a, uh, some running water and a bathroom for Michael out here because he's you know he's sacrificing big time, and we need a bigger clicker press. We need two twenty power. There's a lot we need a, a bigger shop for. But one of the biggest things is like, man, I would love to open it up to have more community base. I had a lady inst uh, message me this morning that was like, "Are you ever going to do a retreat where you have people come out and you know like?" teach the craft and like hang out and talk. I'm like, dude, I would love that. That sounds like a blast. But as of right now, we definitely don't have the right space for it. So I'm, I'm glad you're making some adjustments to, to start, you know, maybe doing it. So is the shop you're moving into going to be a little bigger than what you've got? Yeah. I mean, it's not gonna be massive. It's not like, you know, it's not like district leather supply shop. You know, I think, oh, he, yeah. <laughs> I think he's planning on, so he has some big plans uh, coming too. And we're probably going to have, I don't know, 2,500 to 3,000 square feet. Uh, to you. Wow. So it's not massive, wow. but 
you know, the problem my shop now is we only have a small window of time in every year to invite people in, right? It's mm. uh, early fall in spring, right? In Texas. Because of the heat? It's because in the, in the summer, it's the heat. It's wow. just insane. If I had you, I think Bill came down a couple of years ago. He almost died on me. Here in I, remember, I was in that live stream. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so <laughs> I didn't realize he was uh, he was struggling as bad as he was. <laughs> um, but I, I can't have people in here. It just, just doesn't make sense. Me and Brandon are the only ones crazy enough to, to you know, to stick it out here in the yeah. summer. And then in the winter, it's cold. So it's the it's the it's the climate, but it's also having space too. So new workshop will be have a little more space to spread out. Um, definitely is going to have HVAC, which would be really really oh, yeah. good, and uh, it will start doing some things. And then we'll stay a separate way, and a few years later we'll get even a big maybe a bigger space and have, you know, more like co co working space if you want to call it that for some other makers. Uh, that's a beautiful idea, man. There there definitely needs to be more of that. I, I think like when I was getting started, if there was somewhere I could have joined some kind of membership or building that you could jump in at for like four or 500 a month and have access to like community machines, clicker press, you know, cause no one should be buying that kind of equipment at that level. Yeah. But, but if you could have this kind of like, I don't know, just kind of shared experience where you're sharing clients and sharing work and, you know, maybe this guy just got a massive order and he needs some help and then he can pay exactly. you this person who already has the skill set can jump in and it's just a very like collaborative thing. I, and I know that ex this isn't a new idea. This exists all over the place. I'm, uh, there's one in Nashville that I'm thinking of right now that um, my buddy Ethan, who has Maker a company Space. called Oil and Lumber. Yeah, it's, it's maker spaces. Like they all work together. They're sharing the space. It's yep. a beautiful thing. There's so much that goes into it to like getting it started though, or else I would have already been trying to get it going, but it's expensive and there's a lot of red tape you got to work through. So, well, the way I'm growing my business, I don't ever want to be a full fledged cut and sew manufacturing facility here where I have, you know, me and 15 people just stitching leather all day long. That just sounds like a nightmare to me. Right. I yeah. want to be a design shop and brand, not a, um, a a manufacturing facility, at least not at that scale. Yeah. Uh, so I do have machinery here, but we're not going to ever use it around the clock. We're not ever going to be on the clicker press 24 hours a day. So this idea that maybe some of the extra capacity on the clicker press could be shared with other people and say, hey, Joe from down the street who has his own brand needs to cut some things. OK, I can you know, give him space on the clicker press for, I don't know, 15 bucks an hour or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. We'll come up with it in the future. But that's the kind of place I really, really hate for another maker to miss out on a good opportunity for their for themselves and their business because they didn't have something, right? right. Okay, yeah. well, let me you know share some space with you and you can and help you if you need help, whether it be advice, consulting, machinery, whatever, to help you get through that order. You don't have to put my name on it, right? That's not the point. The point is that what what is the what's the saying? Um, the, the tide, you know, all ships rise with the tide or whatever. Yep. Yep. That's kind of what I'm thinking right now. And uh, anyway, it's 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 a little bit of a, a a stretch, you know. But I think in due time we'll get there. I like uh, I don't know if you follow Jimmy Darista. Oh uh, yeah, oh yeah. Okay, so he's that like, too. that's the guy I think about. Obviously, he doesn't do actually he does do some leather work now. But I think he's working with Weaver on some projects mm -hmm. here. But um, he has this massive, you know. I think they call it the Maker Church at this point. It's this massive, you know, you know, frame building on his property. Yeah, it's and, beautiful too. You know, it is awesome. It's black on the outside, and, and it's it's just a really beautiful thing. And he's always talked as if he wants to allow people to come in on a regular basis. And he's he was doing classes. He was doing like forging classes and welding classes where he'd invite people from all over the country, fifteen or twenty at a time, to come to his property and work and learn these different things. Some things that he taught. Some things that he had other people teach. And I am just very, I admire that. I really like that. And I'd like to, at some point in time, do the same thing in my area. Yeah, he's, all those guys, honestly, are a really good kind of uh, beacon of inspiration, I guess, or to, yeah. someone to kind of look at as a framework for the way it works. Like woodworking definitely has been a kind of a step ahead as far as, like oh, if yeah. you just look at the YouTube world, there's so much community and connection in woodworking. And I feel like leather craft is just getting started. There's, there's a lot of people now making leather craft videos, but it's not, I mean, you don't, you only have a handful of channels that are approaching like the 1 million mark where you go into the woodworking world and, 
or, or just the maker space in general. You have people with right. tens of millions of you know subscribers and and they're doing conferences and they're doing meetups and they're doing all kinds of really cool collaborative stuff. And so I'm hoping that that's kind of where the leathercraft world gets to. That's how I see it. And I'm really looking to them more. as kind of a model for a business uh, structure, you know, the way they're making money, the way they're like creating community and all that without just being a manufacturing facility. Like you said, it doesn't right. sound intriguing to me. <laughs> I, you know, I think we'll get there. You're right. We're behind all the working metal working guys. I mean, one thing that we don't have, we don't have as many um, brands and companies that are willing to, um, pay us for influence and pay us to demo products and things like that. That certainly has an effect on the growth. That's it. I do think it will get there at some point, right? Yeah. Uh, it may just be a little slower because a lot of us are going to just, you know, any money that we make, by the way, making videos does cost money. Uh, you yeah. know, I've learned the hard way. It takes, it's not, a, it's for me, for instance, I don't make videos on YouTube because I'm trying to become a YouTube star and, you know, and, and make a million bucks a month off of YouTube. I'm making videos on YouTube and trying to monetize them just for the sake of making more videos to feed yeah. the community. You know, that's kind of what I'm at. Um, yeah. Anyways, the point of that was that, you know, we don't have Ryobi and all these other brands that are going to feed into us. We have a much smaller group of people and um, a lot of them are not on board with paying for content creation, you know, mm -hmm. just, it will change, I'm sure, but it's going to take a, it's going to take a few more years, I think. Yeah, it's, it's a little outdated, the whole Leathercraft world in general. There's a few companies, like you got Bill, who kind of knows, what's, you know, he, re, he really knows what's going on, like with social media and like the more modern way of running a business and Aaron at Rocky Mountain and, and Buckle Guy, you know, Hugh, these guys. But like when you look at the the companies that have been around forever, like Wicked and Craig, um, you know, I, I've been, it's like pulling teeth trying to get someone who's willing to work with me on things like this and and do it in a way that's beneficial for everyone and help us grow yeah. together. I want to, I want to be in their corner. I've approached this to so many different people and, and like we, we could do beautiful things together, but it's gotta be mutually beneficial. And yeah. um, it, it's, it's really hard to set up. I just, I feel like, you know, I definitely hit a wall like about six months ago where I'm just like, I'm done trying to, to make that work. I just going to make fun videos and, and I think the rest will come. But um, well, yeah, dude, it's a lot of those companies, some of the bigger companies, I think they're just now starting to see us little guys. And I think we are still considered little guys in the oh, yeah. things, right? I hope the viewers don't don't get it mistaken. We are still pretty far down the, yeah. the, the ladder right now. Right. Um, a lot of those big companies, they are putting their their emphasis on the big companies, the shoemakers and manufacturers and the people who are making thousands and thousands of pieces a year. That's not us right now. Right. But I think they're starting to see that, that we have some influence because we talk to each other, right? As yeah. a community, leather crafters, small leather crafters as a community are starting to build more influence. You know, so sure, you don't want to pay me to make a video about, you know, how to make bridal leather or whatever it is or share your tools with me. Okay, right. But just keep in mind, your bigger customers, the shoemaker is not talking to all these guys over here and these gals over here that are also doing really cool things. And there's more of them available than the big shoemakers. And so yeah. I think we're going to start seeing the shift, you know, uh, it's coming. It's a little yeah. tough right now, but it's going to happen. Yeah, it will. It will. It, I've already seen a massive shift. Like, and then this is not to knock anybody, but I, I had a really awesome partnership with Tandy in the beginning, but it was like pulling teeth trying to get that to line up. And, um, and, and even during the partnership, it was like pulling teeth, trying to get certain things to work out. Like, you know, I was so proud of that partnership you had with them. That was a major step forward. I was very proud to see that. Oh, dude, I, I mean, it was the guy that was kind of rooting for me. You know, he was he was pulling some major strings just to get that to work out. And it finally did. And and we did the six month contract and it was it was good. But the funny thing now is like they're doing so much with with all kinds of leather crafters. Now they're flying people into Fort Worth and like bringing them into the headquarters it, and um, uh, Claridge Leather, I think, just did a, a some projects yeah. recently, which is great. He's a great guy. I, I, I've he's had awesome. pleasure meeting him, but he's a great guy, at least on video and stuff. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. really exciting. I have not had the success with Tandy personally, uh, <laughs> but that's partially my fault because I got I got kind of salty and pissy. And, you know, screw them. Uh, well, it's tough. <laughs> it's tough. And I, I, mean, I probably should have been that. I, sh I, I should not have been that way. I just kind of, but. I am very happy to see them reaching out to the, the community now and understanding that Leathercraft is not just um, tooling and not just 
you know, Western whatever, you know. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's other guys and gals out there doing amazing. Nikki and Mallory. Uh, oh, doing dude. Amazing stuff. They're actually one of the ones on my list. I'm doing a video of top five leather workers to watch out for. I love oh, man. Yeah. She's, she's she's doing, awesome. She, I don't know how many people there are, but she's doing awesome work and it's not Western. Exactly. Yeah. You know? And I think she should be given some credit for, for stretching the boundaries of, of leather craft. And so I'm, I'm happy to see people like that. Me too. Yeah. And I think Tandy would be smart to feature more people like that and, and really lean into it. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what I was hoping to bring uh, in, You know, I was like, I'm like, when we first got together, I was like, just so you know, I don't do any tooling. Is that going to be okay? And they're like, no, 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 that's good. That's what we want is a little different angle. Um, but yeah, there, I, I think other companies will kind of jump on board. Like Weaver's done a lot with YouTubers yeah. like Jimmy DiResta, like you said, and, and quarter leather. And so there's some of these bigger companies are definitely like, you know, opening up things and, and making it work. But I, I just, I don't know what it looks like. Like the, the Ryobi in the leather world just doesn't exist. Like there's not a company that's that big that, that has that much of a budget to work with. And so it's tough. Like I'm just kind of in this mode where I'm like, I'm just going to keep making videos and have fun with it. I'm really focused on like growing the community side of it and bringing value, not holding anything back. Like I'm just putting out all my best stuff out for free on YouTube and like whatever comes will come, you know, yeah. um, but, but I'm just not going to worry about it too much. I, I think I'm with you. If, if I just keep, I feel like if I just keep supporting the community um, as a whole yeah. community as, as all will support me also. And um, if I can just cover the cost of making videos, you know, that's, that's mm -hmm. really all I'm after at this point. Um, you know, cause <laughs> who would have thought, man, making videos does, it takes time and it takes a little bit of cash to, to really get that engine going. And I'm, I think you're, you're, so much further along than me. I, I I really love your style of videos. You're very casual and you're candid and you're very personal in them. I feel like every time the camera turns on, I'm like, blah, blah, blah. blah. You know, I, I, turn it, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, so I, well, I, I'm trying to aspire to, to, to be more like you in, in my video. Thank you, dude. I appreciate that. It's funny how the grass is always greener, though, right? Because one of the things I was going to bring up is that I, I watched that belt video you just made recently. Um, yeah. and And like format of, of videos is one of the things I struggle with the most. Like how much am I talking on camera? How much is it just focused on the hands? How is it, is there dialogue? Do I do voiceover? Like there's all this kind of stuff to consider when you're making a video. And, and the format that you used on that is like, it's so simple and just works so well. And I saw that and I was like, man, I got to make more videos like that. It's just straightforward. You're just it's only 25 minutes long, but somehow you fit the whole project into it while you're Let talking. Let me tell you behind the scenes, okay? The behind the scenes on that <laughs> is every time me and my guy Hunter, yeah, uh, who's also a leather worker, although he didn't do he doesn't do much leather work now. He really enjoys the visual storytelling more, it seems. Uh, but every time Hunter comes over, we talk for like an hour and a half about man, what are we gonna do and how are we gonna capture this, you know, this thing, right? And uh, so I all the credit on that video goes to Hunter. Uh, after that long discussion, it's like, okay, dude, you do whatever you want. You're the you're the visual yeah. storyteller. I'm just gonna make a belt. So I get no credit for that other other than being the guy in the video. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. So and then that's my that's my solution. I have Hunter. I those produce videos. He comes over. He shoots. And our goal is to shoot at least two videos a month. We haven't really hit that yet. Um, yeah. I'm finding it tougher to make the more impromptu videos where I'm just gonna set up the camera in the workshop and work and talk. Um, and I don't know, are you, you shoot all your videos yourself, right? I do, but yeah, I, I'll, t I'll tell you what's kind of on my mind about that, but, but you can finish what you were saying. Oh no, I just, you know, I just, again, it's, it's, a. I haven't figured it out as all I'm trying to express to people. It okay. Yeah. Always <laughs> that makes me feel better. <laughs> um, it's always me just experimenting and seeing what works. Yeah. And I'll try it. If it doesn't work. Okay. I won't do that again. You know? Yeah. And that. This is another thing where it's like the grass is always greener because I, I do like the the kind of raw organic feel of like holding the camera in my hand and just documenting what's happening in the moment. Some of the frustrations like I, I try and capture all of that and and get a lot of like the storytelling involved. But the one thing that I'm really struggling with, though, is like I mean, I've been thinking a lot about having some kind of producer in shop full time that's just coming in and filming so that he can come in and film a project he or she and then go back and edit while I keep working on other stuff because that's my biggest bottleneck right now is I film the videos, which usually takes two or three days if it's a longer project. And then the editing usually takes me like over a week. 
and it's throwing me off so bad. I mean, I, I, I want to, my goal is to have a video up a week, but it's impossible. And it's causing a lot of anxiety in me because I can't keep up with it. It's impossible and, to, I mean, but, but there's a difference. I mean, you're running a business also, and this is where we got to give ourselves a little grace. It's a yeah. problem. We can figure it out, but give yourself a little grace because you're running a business. And I look at some other, other YouTubers that are doing great work. Maybe, uh, you know, not Jimmy Durist. Jimmy Durist is a really good guy to, to look at because he does yeah. a ton of content, but he also runs a business where he's producing things, right? But most YouTubers right. don't produce goods. Their good is the content, right? Right, right. We're a little different. We have our goods that we're trying to produce and sell, but we also, it's, so it's tough. So you and I are, are going to flip positions, I think, because I need to do more impromptu content those videos yeah. are short edited, you know, not short, but I need to do short edited, more of a rougher edit type content. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you, I guess it sounds like you want to do more produced content. So yeah. I have Hunter show up twice a month is the goal, right? At some point in time, we'll hopefully get to once a week or whatever. And he shoots it, he edits it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And so we're going nice. to. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we will. I like that. Um, yeah, dude. I, uh, I mean, and the cool thing is we're all going to like learn from each other and figure this out as we go. Like I, yeah. I, I, I'm excited to watch more videos come out from you. I, every time you post one, I get excited because it, well, I just you. love, I mean, I kind of nerd out more on like how, how you're filming and editing more so than like how you're making the belt kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm, I'm different from most people now. And 99% of the people you're watch that are watching your videos are there for the leather craft, but I'm, I'm weird that way. And so, I just get excited, man. Like, I think we have a lot to learn from each other. And then things like this is going to help out a lot too. like, just make it really collaborative. And, and, uh, I love these live streams, man, because there's no editing involved. You just turn the camera right. on and, and we're done. So, um, yeah, dude, this is, this, is, it's, it's so good to watch the stuff you've been working on. And you kind of <laughs> talked about like, you kind of already hit on this, but, um, like when you look at Odin 10 years from now, Odin leather goods. What, what does it look like? Are you, are you, I guess it's kind of that Jimmy DiResta model where you're, you're doing a lot of like community based stuff. Are you even producing things at that point or would you like to move to purely like content based? Yeah. I don't ever see myself being purely content based. I do enjoy growing the business. I mean, that's, that, that's a joy of mine uh, and going, I mean, I, not always a joy, right. But I, I enjoy the end result of growing the business. Um, I'm sure we will continue to be a brand. We are going to continue to produce Odin Leather Goods products. Um, you know, I just don't see myself having a massive manufacturing studio with 15, 20 people in here cutting and stitching all that just does not sound fun to me. Yeah. I want to get to the point where we're designing and we are figuring all, all the ins and outs and then maybe get some production support to help out with those things. Yeah. Uh, that's where I want to be. And then the shop will be used for as more like a laboratory, a community based you know, place to have a community events and also for us to test out new designs. Right. Um, there are certain things that we'll always do here. For instance, if I get an order for five thousand coasters, I'm always I mean, that's just we're really we're set up well to do that type of stuff. Yeah. Like chains, or wallets or whatever it is. We can do that. What I'm not really set up well for someone came to me and said, hey, I a thousand messenger bags. <sighs> yeah, that's tough <laughs> right it's really tough do you have yeah. dies made for your bags or are you hand cutting the, the bigger i pieces? still hand cut all the bigger pieces yeah, yeah. i uh I, I do need to talk to the guys over at hammerhead press i do want to get another clicker press at some point that will accommodate those really big dies but right now uh it's they're also hand cut yeah and i have a ton of dies i'm wrong i got i have more dies than i deserve uh but the big pieces yeah we're still hand cut Wow, so, man. Yeah. That's kind of where we're going. Yeah, 10 years, big, big brand, bigger shop, you know, more community events. Uh, I would like to see myself having another retail store. That's been a interesting challenge. I never even worked retail before opening the retail store. So that's been a, uh, a pretty steep learning curve to go through, especially in this era, this pandemic era, um, you know, uh, season that we've been in. Uh, but I can see ourselves having another, another retail store too. Dude, that okay. That we got to talk about that because yeah. I love the retail store, and I'm really curious to know how it's going for you and and like what you've learned in it. I mean, one thing I know is that like leather goods are gonna sell better if you can feel them and smell them and experience it firsthand. You just can't express that over uh, online through an image. And so I've always wondered how much better things would sell in an in a retail environment. But it also comes with a lot of downfalls too, like people touching your. Yeah. your products and like 
wearing it, you know, the sun baking on some of that stuff through the window, I'm sure. And then the overhead pricing. I mean, just talk talk me through all this kind of stuff. You, I love you it. really hit the high ones. I wish I had talked to you <laughs> before I opened my retail store because you may have, may have warned me about, about some of these things. <laughs> you know, there are certain things that I can sell online all day long, right? Yeah. Um, you know, because the pool of potential customers is so much larger, right? And right. so in the store, I have like I have one wallet that online I sell really well, really well. It's just no staff wallets. I we call it a miles wallet. I sell it online all day long, no problem. In the store, not at all. Not, not very. I don't sell wow. many at all. Really? Now, and I what I figured out what I, what I think I figured out is the pool of people that are looking at it online, the ones that are buying it again, larger pool uh, of people. They have an imagination. See, okay, I see exactly how it's going to be used. They look at the pictures. They see the videos I've made over time. They're like, I get, I get it. I see it. Mm -hmm. In a retail store, it's just some, something sitting on a shelf. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's no context around it. There's no videos around it. There's no guy holding it. Right. right. My retail people, they're not there. You know, they're not, they're not, I'm not, they're not, I'm, they're not me. Right. Yeah. If someone comes yeah. in, all they have to do is they see it. They don't see, they don't even see it as a wallet. They see it as some leather thing with a snap on it. Right. So it's really yeah. now you have other things that I sell all day long in the store. I can't sell online. Right. It's what kind of things are those? What's what sells good in the retail? Uh, oh, my bags sell really well in retail because a lady really? come in. They can. I mean, literally, I, I, I should like do a video stream of this of people putting their head inside the bag. You right? <laughs> they, yeah, they walk in, they pick up the bag. They literally put their head in. They take this big whiff of the <laughs> I, I can't even smell it anymore. But that alone helps sell a bag. They can touch wow. it, feel it, they can smell it, right? Uh, I mean, I, and I do sell bags online, but in the store, the conversion seems to be a little easier and better on the bigger pieces in the store, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, things like that. It's just strange. You know, I'm learning as I go. I'm learning that if I put, uh, I may take one item, I may put it on a shelf, it won't sell at all. And I then I put, I lay it flat, it sells all day long. Or if I turn it sideways, it'll sell. But if I turn it the other way, it won't sell. Retail is a very finicky business. And yeah. It's been fun. Um, but it is, it's definitely a learning curve, you know, and how much time are you spending at the store these days? My wife tries to keep me out of the store as much as possible. Keep you out of it? Out of the store. Okay. So yeah. when we started this, I, I assumed that I was going to be in the store. I'm going to be by there once a day, no matter what, you know, you know, maybe for you people, you only have 24 hours a day, but damn it, I've got 48, right? Now yeah. Okay. That was stupid. That's just, <laughs> <laughs> that was never going to happen. As much as I wanted to, it's never going to happen. Um, my wife has stepped up big time. She has stepped in there and she runs the store. It may be it may be called Odin Leather Goods, but it is Rachelle Show when you walk the store. And I was really worried about that. And, and we could probably have an old another discussion about spouses and wives and, and yeah. business. I mean, that's a whole other. You know, we should have a freaking conference on that. We should. Uh, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and they should have their moments of being able to tell exactly what they went through as well, because we're not always easy guys to deal with. But uh, yeah. she stepped in and she runs the store. She does an incredible job. All my concerns about, you know, how things are positioned and, and presented. She's figured me out. She's figured the brand out. And then she's also added her own touch to it. So the store is running because of her. She's there, you know, every day, once a day. We have great retail staff. And me, I stop by. It's, I feel like I'm visiting when I stop by. <laughs> You're just a guest. Just a guest. Yeah. I, I kind of I used to have a cup of coffee. I'm just kind of like, oh yeah, it's cool, you know. Oh, that's cool. I didn't realize we're doing that, and I'm just walking around, and yeah. you know, it is it's the right thing to do. I'm lucky to have a partner that can do that. She keeps me out of the store as much as possible. I stop by when I can, but I'm not stopping by every day. And now for customers, that was a big change for them because they were expecting me to be in the store uh, because Odin Leather Goods was me, Odin. And now we're growing to the point. You're talking about where we're going to be in ten years. You know, it, Odin, me, the individual is going to be less important and the brand is going to be more important. And that's the way it should be. Yeah. That's a much more sustainable model than everything having to revolve around me. When people call and they want to talk about a custom project or a big project, you know, they've had to start getting used to talking to my wife. Mm -hmm. Right. She does an incredible job. Right. Yeah. She can handle it all. Probably better than I can have time. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, Odin, again, Odin has to get beyond just being the individual and be more about the brand. So long answer. I, I apologize. But uh, oh, I love that. The, the short answer was she keeps she tries to keep me out of there. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the kind of nitty gritty stuff I love hearing about. I, and it's funny how, you know, we, we were we have a lot in common in that way. Like Wit and Rochelle sound very similar in that way. Wit's very if, uh, efficient. 
and productive. She gets things done. The problem is she doesn't get hardly any of the credit because she's usually not the one like on camera like this, Yeah. but she's doing the majority of the work. Honestly, she yeah. does all of our shipping. She does, you know, packing. She's, she, um, constantly just working on like the back end side of our business, the stuff that no one sees. Yeah. And, uh, it's exhausting because she also is a full-time mom, you know, where I come out here, you know, 10, 12 hours a day. Yeah. Uh, I put in a lot of time and I, and she, she's expected to kind of like be with the kids and also get everything done on the stock and barrel side. Yeah. And so we've been balancing that a little bit. Like I've been trying to step in and take the kids and let her just get work done. And we're, we're splitting it up a little bit more just cause she's taken on more of a role, but, but yeah, man, I mean, I, I what would we do without our ladies? I don't know. Well, I would say we wouldn't be where we are today. I know that much. I'd, yeah. I'd be, I'd be living in a cheap apartment, you know, uh, driving a crappy car and, <laughs> and uh, you know, wasting money probably is what I'd be doing, you know, with her. Yeah. Things really come together. And, um, you know, it's not it's, it's not always been perfect, man, but it's an incredible story. And again, I'm sure you have your own. Our wives could tell their own stories. They could write their own books about dealing with us as we grow these businesses, being in the background when really they're doing such incredible work and, and um you know, it, it, you know, here's another thing. Now, for, for me, you know, getting to a point where I could relinquish some of that stuff and I could trust and I could say, you know, you've got it. I don't have to worry about it, you know, not having to double check emails. And I wouldn't double check emails and conversations because I didn't trust her. It was because, or excuse me, it wasn't because she couldn't do it. She obviously can. It was because I was so used to doing it all myself. Right. Yeah. So it's been a lot of growth going on around here, you know. I was going to say last year or two, but really it's going to be the last eight, nine years I've been doing this. It's been a lot of growth and we're, yeah. we've got a lot more to do. So. I love to hear that, man. That's just like, that's just music to my ears. Um, I just, I love hearing when people are doing well and, and things are working out. And I know there's always the other side of that too, but, but in general, I know you guys are doing really well and that's, that's good to hear. Well, I appreciate it. I, 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 I am confident to say, I think we are on the right path. Things are looking well. I'm happy with where we are right now. I don't feel like I'm chasing uh, anything except for maybe the clock. I'm chasing the clock. And that's about all. Yep. Uh, yep. You know, and I, I, I'm the future is optimistic. I mean, I'm, it's bright. We've got a lot of things going for us. And, you know, we'll see what happens next year. <laughs> Although 2021 is almost over. I don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe it, dude. I, Yeah, time is a son of a gun, man. It just <laughs> sneaks up on you. I can't believe it. Like someone commented on an old video of mine recently. And you know how like you'll see in your notifications, like a comment come up on YouTube and it's a video that was what seems to me like six months ago, but it was like five years ago. And, and I can see Indy, my oldest, she's just like a baby. And I'm like, what? Yep. And, and so, um, man, I mean, you got to hold on tight and you got to like, like one thing that I've been stressing a lot, like in there, in our, in that group that that we we have a lot of conversations about like business stuff in that facebook group with our course like one of my main focuses is like keep in mind what you really really want with yeah. your business and and also your life that has to blend together not just you know maybe a lot of people would say they want to be a you know a multi-million dollar ceo of some massive tech company or something like that's never been my dream at all and and so like it's really important for me to focus on what i really want like like, do I want a massive manufacturing facility that's going to take up a ton of time and just so, you know, it's going to cause me to be there for 60 hours a week? Yeah. And um, or, or do I want something that's a little more passive where I can explore lots of fun projects and and we can um, I can involve my family more. And so that's the kind of thing that I've been really focusing on is like, what is the that overall picture that I want? And then just make sure that every day is is striving for that because yeah. time will get you, man. And I think that's important, Ben. Have a, I, I had a guy tell me once, basically, you got to pick a point in the horizon and and, and, and and go that direction. And if that's the business you want, go there. And you can always change. You can always adjust your 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 course, right? But yeah. you need to pick something out there and say, hey, I want to be this at some, some period of time, right? And, yep. point there. and so when, as you're making decisions throughout the day, you say, okay, that takes me off course. Which sometimes, again, you have to say, well, maybe the course is changed. That's fine. But you can't just be flailing around all day long throughout the week and throughout the year, hoping it all comes together. You need to pick something on the horizon and go that direction. So not to start preaching or anything, but uh, I totally me, agree. that's that's kind of where I am. I, I have a, a, a 
it may be a fuzzy vision, but I have a, a at least a vision of yeah. what I want to be when I grow up. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's what we're doing. And it may yeah. change the next year. Something may happen where I say, you know, what? I don't want to do that anymore. I want to do this and we'll change. We'll course correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is way beside the point, but do you have like a formal education background? Did you, did you grad? What, what did you do in school? Yeah. So I, I went to Texas A&M University, the Texas A&M University uh, whoop, class of fighting class 2002. I, I uh, got a degree in marketing. Um, and so business was always my thing. I originally thought I was going to be in the finance game. My father was in finance. Um, uh, he's, he, well, I need to clarify that. He ran a small community credit union for 40 plus years. And so he was, when I say financing, more like community banking is what he was in. Uh, so I figured I was going to do the same thing, to be honest with you, because uh, that credit union was started in, in my in the house I grew up in. Um, got to college, realized I didn't want to do finance because finance guys basically sit on the phone and cold call people all day long, asking for mutual funds and stuff. That yeah. was slow death. But I really <laughs> yeah. enjoyed marketing, and I'll, I'll tell you how I how marketing kind of got into under my skin is I'm not a um, I was never the guy to to want to be seen. I'm I'm behind the scenes type guy. I learned somewhere along the way that I can make a lot more money. Um, Creating basically parties. So in high school, I used to throw parties and get paid to throw parties. And I charge three dollars a the head and I'd have to make flyers, right? So my entry point into marketing was making flyers for these parties we were throwing, right? And I was like, I really enjoy this. You know, it's my deal. Went to yeah. college, people were like, Hey, we need someone who's gonna do these flyers for us. We're gonna do this. We're gonna, I was like, I don't know how to do it, but I'll I'll go down a I'd skip class in college, go to Barnes and Noble grab a book on Photoshop or Dreamweaver or whatever the project was, mm -hmm. skip class and go read a book in Barnes & Noble because I couldn't afford to buy it. And I'd figure out all these different things. And i just keep on parlaying them into a little more cash here, a little more cash there, kept on going. And that's kind of how I got into marketing. Then I realized eventually that uh, marketing wasn't just graphics and advertising stuff. It was much more to it and really leaned in on that. And so my background has always been in marketing, uh, specifically online marketing is where uh, I spend my time and I still have uh, I still work with a number of big companies now, uh, one in particular that I do a lot of the marketing work for them online. So wow, um, that's cool. Yeah. So I've parlayed that into, you know, not parlay. I shouldn't say I've parlayed it. I've used that experience on the corporate marketing side to help my business. And that it, it has helped me, especially with the online portion of things. Yeah, it, it makes so much more sense now. And and now that I think about it, we did talk about that in Georgia. I got that kind of backstory from you, but it, it just makes so much sense because I mean that's one thing Odin Leather Goods is just nails on the head is marketing, branding, merchandising, just creating the whole experience. And that's what I found too, is like I mean, I'm bootstrapping my marketing experience here. I don't have any formal education, but what I found is that it's much less about like, oh, I need to start an Instagram page. It's about the why behind everything. It's the storytelling behind it. It's about like t tapping into those mental triggers that cause people to want to do things and want to move. Right. And um, that, that's I'm, I'm learning every day and I'm trying to figure it out. But but you've done a really good job with that. Well, thank you. And again, this is an area where I feel like I'm, I'm always behind because if you if you hire me to come help your business, we can talk all day long. <laughs> When I go home, I have to do it yeah. on my business. I'm like, oh God, I don't know what I'm doing here, right? Uh, <laughs> it's you know the whole thing about the cobbler's kids have no shoes. Yeah, uh, it's it's. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate you saying that because um, when we're looking at our own businesses and brands, you know, we're always thinking about we're looking at the deficiencies. I'm sure, and where yeah. we wish we would have done something different. And it's nice to hear. Uh, not that we need always a pat on the back, but it's nice to hear from other people that it's not as bad as we think it is. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know if you caught it, but um. <laughs> we we were we both did Don Gonzalez's podcast and and in yours you mentioned something about how um we've done a good job with merchandising and I about like fell out of my chair because I feel like that's one area where I'm really falling short and I was like this guy man he oh. nails everything with merchandising packaging and so when I went on his podcast, I was like <laughs> I, I made sure to set the record straight. I was like, he's the one that's good at it. And uh oh. I, I mean it though. I mean, I, I, you know, your imagery is outstanding, dude. I mean, my Thank imagery you. is just, you know, the same iPhone shot over and over again in my workshop. Your imagery, it really evokes a bit of a brand, you know, that that Western, you know, I mean, maybe stock and barrel, it really evokes it, you know, in a very oh, subtle you. way. Um, is your, your wife has a photography background, right? 
Um, not not like a background, but but stock and barrels kind of brought it out of both of us. We just oh, really man. got really into it and learned to love it. And you guys, I mean, I, again, I don't know what, what really happens over there, but you guys come across like you know exactly what you're doing. I pull out my DLS camera, I'm just flipping switches, taking a thousand shots, praying to God one of them comes out. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, man. That, that means a lot. It's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, but, and, and what I was kind of like even more specifically referencing was like your product merchandising. Like, like one thing I've always struggled with is our cord tacos. Like we've got them down at our little retail spot and down at our downtown Weber state campus. And yeah. like, no one even knows what they are. They're sitting there in this bucket. And I'm like, I'm like, how do you get the messaging across? And then I see what you're doing. I'm like, okay, yeah, he's got it figured out. Like there's a way of doing this the right way. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things like I just feel like I'm falling short on. And, and just like with anything, I've got to-do lists. Just You should see my notes app, man. I've got like 800 <laughs> different notes apps with things that I need to do and improve and update. And um, so, yeah, it's one of those like comparison things. I'm like, yeah, he's got it all figured out. But, you, uh, if, you me out with, if you help me out with my shippers and boxes, because you guys do an <laughs> awesome job with that. I hope you have your tacos. We'll come up with some. We'll, we'll do some. You know, we'll share some uh, some experience. Yeah, dude, I like that. We could do that. Yeah, our, ours is a pretty simple situation, honestly. We just work with this company called Company Box, and and they do a good job. The only downfall is like the timing, and I, and that might just be with anybody, but like it takes us like six months to get our boxes in, and really, sometimes when we run out, we're like, oh boy, what do we do? We're going to Staples and like finding whatever we can find. So. <laughs> Do you have one box that you use for multiple products or we've kind of you? we've kind of figured it out where like we've got a small one that fits most of our wallets and then like for some of our bigger wallets like the trucker and the women's one we've got a little bit bigger box that we use for belts and and other things like that and then with our our bags we we package those totally differently you know they're all like wrapped up and putting it so we don't have a huge skew list you know we got a simple product line so shipping's not a huge deal but. My my list of SKUs is getting bigger and bigger, it seems. And so we, we are going to start culling the pack down a little bit and removing some SKUs. But, you know, who would have thought that running a business, you'd have to spend so much time just thinking about over boxes? What box, what size box do I need? Do I want to have yeah. two versions of a box? Do I want to have two different versions or do I need 20 versions of a box? I mean, these are all the little things that I think that the community can share with each other over time and help other people avoid these mistakes. Because how much money have you wasted? No, how much money have I wasted over the last nine years experimenting on, okay, which tape do I use? Which plastic bag do I use? Which box do I use? None of, none of that has anything so to do with leather craft. Nothing to do with leather craft. It has everything yeah. to do with fulfillment and other business related activities, right? And so it's tough, you know, and I tell people that are looking to, to jump out and do their own business, say, hey, you know, take a risk, try it, but just realize that just because you quit your day job and get eight more hours in a day doesn't mean you're going to double your your revenue, right? right. You're going to feel that time worrying about all these other little things that you never even considered you have to do. Yeah, it blindsides you. Oh. And it's so much. It's not just the packaging. I mean, I, we oh, could so probably more. both just go down the list of like, you know, like some, I, I think a lot of people, when they picture what we do, they just see us sitting at a workbench peening rivets for 40 hours a week. I'm like, dude, that's like, I, I wish I wish I had more time for leather work. I, I right. spend so much time with everything else that, you know, uh, I'm lucky to have Michael's help in here. He's he's really helped us like step up our game with, you know, getting more things made out of this shop. But I just I don't have enough time to do the things I want to. And, and that needs to be. I, that's one thing I talk about with the course is like, I don't want people to think, Hey, quit your job because this is a fast, easy way of getting rich quick. It's like complete opposite. Like right. this needs to be something that you love doing. And if you're going to be doing it anyway, you might as well be making some money on it, yeah. but here's the things that you need to watch out for because it's going to blindside you. So that's, I'd say that's more of what our course is, is more of a warning sign. It's like, all right, we're going to do this. Then just so you know, this is what's coming. Um, but yeah, it's it's crazy, man. There's there's so much to it. Like you, I have I, well, probably I spend most of my workday here at this desk. You know, wow, this, yeah. this is where business takes place. And then, for, like you, yeah, I think the gentleman's name is Michael. I have Brandon. You know, you guys have probably seen mm -hmm. Brandon in my pictures. Brandon used to run a little company also, but yeah. Brandon's out there cranking stuff out all day long, right? And often, what happens is. At the end of the day, when I'm done in the office, he's going home. I go do like second shift, and then I'm the, and that's my time to kind of play around and 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 push through and get other things done. Oh, that's uh, good. But you know, 
the way in which I do Leathercraft has had to change and evolve over time so, so that I can continue, you know, keep the business going is what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah. Michael Strickland over at Lowell Strickland. Yeah. Uh, when I kind of struck out on my own and started doing this, he was really kind and gave me some good, just good words of advice. And um, he gave me some books to read. One of them called Profit First, which was a really good book. Changed the way I look at finances in the business. That really, really mm. helped. Uh, check that out. It's yeah. uh I didn't read it. I actually did the audio book because I'm, I'm more of all. Oh, I, I'm all audio book. Yeah, yeah. all about it's it. It's called Profit First, and that was really helpful. But again, it's just one more example of how other leather workers and business owners reached out and said, "Hey, let me help you stay out of the you know the deep waters yeah. and uh, and keep you out of these 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 pitfalls." So, well, that's cool. I'll have to check that book out. Um, I want to get to some of these questions. I know you're insanely busy. Speaking of time disappearing on us, um, it's been an hour. I just want to hit some of these questions really quick. So let's just do some of these quick ones uh, right here. We got Hima Youssef says, is leather work more of a talent or an experience? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think it can be, be both, right? Um, I'm sorry, I ramble. I have long answers, but so I think there's different types of leather work and you can find a great enjoyment and build business in, in those different areas. You can be an artist. You can be like a Clint Wilkinson. You can be like some of these um, some of you guys that are very meticulous and very, very fine leather craft. Just beautiful, beautiful work. Or you can be more of a production guy or you can be a, a you know, one off guy. I mean, there's so many different ways you can hit leather craft uh, to grow your business. Um, I think it can be both for the artist. Maybe it's more of experience. You know, because they are focused on every little detail and they take enjoyment out of every single stitch they pull. Right. Or it could be more of, you know, a, a, I don't know. I don't like to say it'd be a talent or, or experience. Short answer. It could be both. Um, you find your joy in the craft where you want it. Maybe you find joy making thousands of pieces. Maybe you find joy making one piece. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's all leather craft. Whether you tool, you don't tool, you hand stitch, you machine stitch. It doesn't matter. It's all leather craft. Take your own path. It's it's fine. Yeah, I totally agree. That's a great answer right there. Um, I don't know if you know Josiah. He's a good dude. Um, he says, Odin, your philosophy that you can grow your biz more than you can think before you quit the nine to five has helped me relax on that concept mentally and just plug away all in good time. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Did you hit it? Yeah, we hit on that on this a little bit or is he talking about something else? You Did you bring well, that up in other? I think what he and I have talked about all the time is uh, I'm not not necessarily him particularly, but so many people are talking about quitting their day job because they want to grow their leather craft business. Yep. And the question is, why do you want to quit your day job? Right. I'm not a big fan of that. I got, I have a family, I have kids and I'm not interested in living an artist lifestyle. I'll be honest with you. Right. Um, you know, my days of eating spam and bologna because that's all I had is, is, is over. I don't want to do yeah. that. anymore, Right. Uh, and so I'm like, Hey, if you think you don't have time, if you don't, th if you think you don't have enough time in your day to do more leather craft and grow your business, you're wrong. And the first question I ask most guys and gals that ask me that question, ask me about that is, I say, well, what was the score of the game? It doesn't matter what game it is, but inevitably they always have some answer. Oh, the Knicks scored 80 points, 90 points, whatever. I say, well, there's your time. You know, yeah. you, you're, you're letting time go away from you because you need to relax, you need to do all this. And those aren't bad things. It's just, a, it's, I only pointed out to say, if you need more time, you can find more time in your day. Go hustle a little more. And looking at your day job is something that's holding you back. Maybe start looking at your day job as something that's going to fund or put capital into your real business. If you think that Leathercraft is going to be your real business, right? We we'll all do. We have to find capital wherever we can. I've not been one. I don't have a business partner. I don't have any loans. I don't. I'm just totally bootstrapped here, right? You know. And when I need more money, or when I had to get more money in the past, I basically had consulting clients that would help put money into my business, right? So just flip things over, flip things around. Um, don't feel the need to rush and quit your day job. I think that's a usually a bad plan for most people. How much we have two checks coming in than one check. Um, you don't quit your day job until you are absolutely sure you have no other options but to do that. Keep it going. I totally agree. I think it's a good kind of proof of concept too. If you're working full time and you really want to do this that bad, mm -hmm. um, then then you got to put in some time of like you know working late into the night you got to be working on weekends you got to see what you're willing to sacrifice yeah. to make it work because because if you quit your job and you don't love this that much then um you just made a massive mistake so i think that little window of uh grinding and just like bleeding out of your eyeballs because you haven't slept for a week because <laughs> you love this so much and you want it that bad 
then then that's when you know you know you're 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 in the right place and so yeah. i yeah I, I don't think you should quit i think you gotta you gotta keep that paycheck coming as long as you can until you just absolutely can't make it work anymore and the one thing uh, I'll answer is i think you also have to make sure you're not trying to escape something else right so Oftentimes yeah. we're trying to escape working for someone else. Well, I got to tell you, if you don't like working for someone else and you don't like having to report to other people, running your own business is not much different. Now you're going to have instead of one person to report to, you're going to have thousands of people to report to if you're lucky. Yeah. Right. Because yep. all your customers are now your bosses, you know, so yep. you really got to make sure your heart's in the right place. I'm not saying don't do it. It's a it's a wonderful experience. And I, I, I think more people should should give entrepreneurship a try. But your head needs to be in the right place for it. Yeah, and just for anyone who's who's uh, like really curious about that, I'm not trying to plug our course. It just keeps coming to mind because uh, of this topic. But um, we have a financial section in there where my business partner Thomas kind of takes a hold of it, and he's a very conservative guy when it comes to finances. Like he's always been on the side of like I'm maybe a little bit more in like head in the clouds, kind of a dreamer. Like yeah, do what you love, kind of thing. But he's always more of like no, we're gonna stick this out. We're going to keep working in that little wood janky shop that you guys are in until we absolutely can't do it anymore. Yep. And, um, and and that's kind of how he is about like the quitting your job thing. Like, I don't know how many times it's mentioned in that course, but do not quit your job. Uh, you know, keep it as long as you can until you absolutely have no other choice. I'm with that. Um, one other question. Oh, Andrea says, what was the name of that book again? Uh, Profit First. Let me make sure I'm getting that right. I'm known to... Get names wrong. Yep. Profit first by, by Michael Michael something. I don't know what it is, but it's called Profit First. <clears throat> Look it up on Amazon. <clears throat> um, Michael Strickland is one that recommended it to me. You can get it on Audible as well. It's a really, really good book. It starts okay. off it, it on the back end of the book, there's some more technical things about accounting and things like that. But the front end of the book is more about a mindset about how to control your finances in your business. And um, it really helped me out. I really I don't follow it. To, I don't follow it verbatim these days, but yeah. it definitely set the tone for how I control uh, my finances in the business. Beautiful. Cool. I got to check are, that out, too. And, you know, and, and the proving the put is in the pudding. We are still you know, cash run business. We don't have debt and, you know, credit cards and beautiful phones and all that kind of stuff. Though. Yeah. I love that. <clears throat> um, okay. We'll just do a couple more here. Uh, well, I'll just mention Josiah said that he set aside softball league this year because of this very illustration. Helpful thought. Thank you. Nice man. Hey, it's, sacrifices. It, you don't have to be a nut like me, <laughs> but, you know, uh, and let it all go. I mean, that's not the point is to say you shouldn't have enjoyment. You shouldn't have downtime. You shouldn't have relaxation. I'm not saying you shouldn't spend time with your family. That's not the case at all. I'm just saying, you know, you can find more time throughout the day here and there, right? Yeah. yeah. Make small sacrifices is all I'm saying. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I guess Odin and I are good, are a good uh, example of that. Cause like we honestly didn't have the choice because of our family situation. Like you and I are unique in that way. Like I, there's a few people I follow where they're single guys and they literally spent like they live in their workshop or their store. There's, I want to start naming some, but I'm afraid this might have more of a negative connotation and it doesn't, but, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's guys that are spending way more time than, than I'll ever be able to dream of doing because, um, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a healthy thing because I still like make it a huge point to, end the day at a, at a, where I have enough time to spend time with the kids and, and yeah. you know, go on bike rides and just do all the normal stuff too. So yeah, I hope our message isn't getting too twisted here, but yeah, uh, you know, you gotta have family. family's yeah. very important for me. You know, we're talking about bragging on our wives earlier, but for me, my wife was really sport because she would bring the kids to me. Oh, cool. Right. And I mean, that's more than anyone should ask their wives to do. But she was like, oh, I know you don't need to leave the workshop right now. You're busy. I'll just bring the kids to you. And we have many a dinner, family dinner here in the workshop, just so I didn't have to leave. Because if I left, I'd lose 30 minutes out of the day or an hour out of the day. You know, yeah. so there's ways to work things out. Yeah, we're, we're definitely not advocating that you give up your life. We're just saying, <laughs> yeah. you know, you find you, there's opportunities out there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um. Let's see. Uh, Haunted Chronicles says, wow, my two favorite leather work channels together. Thank you. I really Thank appreciate that. That's awesome. That's a big compliment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what would you say to someone who doesn't have a 
Full time job. Okay. Well, here, there's one back here that I missed that I wanted to bring up. This will be kind of the last. This is this might require a little bit of a longer. Oh, not that one. Right here. This might require a little bit of a longer answer. So this will be our last one. I'll let you go. But what are your thoughts on this? Um. So I think that's you could you could see it that way. There's far more leather workers available and in the marketplace than there were in the past. But again, I'll go back to something we said in the earlier conversation is there is truly enough customers and work out there for all of us, right? Don't be mistaken by Instagram and YouTube and whatever else you're looking at, TikTok, whatever else that, oh, there's too many leather workers out there. I'll never sell a single wallet. Yeah. It's, that's just not the case, you know? <clears throat> um, I mean, if that was the case, you know, well, I don't even know what to say about that. There's more than enough room for you to do your thing. I think the trick is you need to find your own niche. I would say try not to be all things. You know, if if you enjoy making wallets, stick to wallets. If you enjoy making bags, stick to bags. If you enjoy making tooling, stick to doing that. And carve out your own niche. And you could literally be dropped next to another leather worker at a farmer's market, for instance, and you guys could still both be successful. Okay? Because you're different. You offer different things. Your style is going to be appreciated by one customer and the, the other guy's style or other guy's style will be appreciated by another customer. It's okay. Just keep on running your race. Um, keep on doing your thing. Keep your head focused on your path and with your point on the horizon and don't be distracted by other leather workers popping up next to you. You know, in fact, you know, one way to do it, and I think this is what a lot of us are doing, Parker, you're certainly doing it, is saying, hey, welcome to the club, guys, gals. You know, mm -hmm. what can we do to work together? Yeah, That's yeah. a much better way to live than be worried about, oh, my God, there's one more in my market. Well, really, they're yeah. not. You know, the guys in California, you're in, you know, Utah or whatever. It, there's enough room for all of us. Absolutely, man. Yeah, that, I've, I've heard it been <clears> – <throat> I can't remember who specifically said it now, but so, I think someone was saying don't consider leather work an art. And, and there's part of that where I agree, but I think that – in terms of this topic, I think we have to kind of look at it as an art form because every single leather worker pops out completely different products and everything looks so different. And there's a person out there who wants what you're making specifically because of the way you do it. And they like your style and your quality and, and your story. And so, so there's, there's no way that we're even close to touching a saturated market. I think, I think that if you're trying to make the same exact wallet, everyone else is just with a different logo down in the corner, then you are going to struggle. I think, I think that it's, it is harder, but, but there's so much, so many ways of, of branching out and being different and being unique and just kind of using your own voice and coming up with something totally different. So it, here, uh, it, here, I, one, I always, I always have one more thing. Here's one yeah. thing. is if you're both playing in the same sandbox, Yes, I guess it could get saturated. Okay. Yep. Especially on Instagram. There's a finite amount of followers available on Instagram. If you think that you are, there's a lot of people selling those same followers now. If you, however, would not look at Instagram or YouTube and just look at your local farmer's market, as it, which is a great place to start, if you, if you ask me, how many leather workers are there? Yeah. Right. I really got, my business really started to grow when I stopped focusing on, Instagram selling to everyone across the country and just start focusing on, okay, how can I be significant in my town? How can I be significant in my neighborhood, my town, my state, my metroplex area? Things changed, right? So think about it like that. If you're only selling on Instagram, again, I'm using an example. It could be anything. If you're only selling there are Etsy, very finite marketplace, right? But if you're thinking about it in terms of your regional area, your town, there's probably a lot of success still available in your small area. Go after that instead. Totally. Yeah, I love that. That's beautiful. And I just want to say Tim Singler said, Shane at the DLS meetup said customers are buying into your story. And uh, I just want to say hi to Tim. He's an awesome dude. Uh, got to meet and chat with him. Uh, Odin and I both did at that event. Awesome guy right there. So Odin, dude, thank you so much for the wisdom, the, the camaraderie. I just, I love the I love that we can have these conversations. Is there something that you want to be plugging right now and, and pushing um, you know, the normal things I, uh, am, sh am somewhat ashamed to say I started a TikTok account last week. Uh, <laughs> hey, <yeah. laughs> Don't be ashamed, dude. Everyone's I, doing it. <laughs> I try to be an old fogey as long as possible. And, you know, I, okay, I lost, right? So TikTok <laughs> started. we'll see what we can do over there. Obviously, Instagram, where we're really putting a lot of emphasis right now is going to be on, uh, on YouTube. Follow me on YouTube, comment, talk, communicate with me. Uh, let me know what you like. Let me know, let me know what you don't like and uh, what you want to see. And we'll keep on doing that. 
And uh, other than that, you know, I just appreciate everyone's support. Uh, I would not be here. I would not be talking to you right now, Parker, if uh, if the customers and fans and most of our fans are not customers. In fact, they're just other community members, which is completely yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, they're the ones that are kind of fueling our growth right now. And I really appreciate it. Well, I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, dude. You bring a lot of value to the whole community in this world and lucky to have you, man. So thank you so thank much you, for doing this. Thanks for leading out on this. We appreciate it. Yeah, well, take care. All right, see you. All right, guys, um, we're still live, it looks like. Thank you so much for jumping in. That was Odin of Odin Leather Goods. Go check out his YouTube channel, TikTok, Instagram just value bombs every day. He's he's one of those guys that's really good at just documenting the workflow, the, like the projects that are on his workbench in the moment. I love following him. So um, again, thank you so much, Odin, for jumping in. Uh, this has been fun. I can't wait for the next one. I've been messaging people uh, nonstop, getting people lined up for future uh, guest live streams. So thank you guys for jumping in for all the comments and uh, we'll be doing this again soon. So have a good one and we'll see you on the next one.